So let, let's talk about entrepreneurs out there in the age of AngelList yeah. and knowing that you need a lot more money and time to build a quality technology-based enterprise-facing product, right? What's happening in that market? How can a platform like AngelList help or hinder that? Sure. Um, and, and you know, maybe maybe give us a view into how those companies are formed because they don't get as much yeah. coverage, uh, yeah. you know, as like hot tech yeah. companies. Yeah, so maybe starting with AngelList, you know, I personally think AngelList is doing the community, you know, tremendous service because AngelList is, you know, helping bring capital in an efficient way, you know, to a broader set of entrepreneurs, you know, where it may or may not, the capital may or may not have been available. So I think that's a tremendous advantage and, you know, I think Naval and the team there are doing a tremendous job. I think that said, right, I would say on the enterprise side in particular, right, it's my observation that, you know, typically to build an enterprise grade or enterprise scale product, release one product, whether that's software or software hardware together, it often takes, you know, let's say 15 to 25 engineers, you know, working for between 12 to 18 months to deliver kind of a basic 1.0 offering into the hands of a customer. And if you run the math on that in terms of what that takes from a financing perspective, it typically ends up being somewhere between four to eight million dollars, which is why you often will see, you know, many Series A's for enterprise companies, you know, scoped somewhere in that range. Uh, there is a little bit of creep up in these rounds uh, more recently, just driven by, let's say, an excess of capital out there, and also entrepreneurs sometimes want to add a little bit more buffer in terms of as they raise these rounds. So a couple questions around yeah. this. So let's say company raises five million yeah. to build, you know, they're uh, refugees from, uh, you know, leaving another company. It's right. really great, great team. Um, one question that probably comes up is just talent fragmentation, right? Yeah. So how do you address that? Because it seems like there's such a huge incentive for so many other people who are also defecting from companies yeah. to start their own rather than become employee number eight or number 12 to get to the 15 or 25 yes. you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I think I think the reality is like if you look at any, if you look at most areas, right, or most many attractive areas or market segments on the enterprise side, there are many smart people sitting in many companies that see these areas, and what ends up happening is there are many efforts that get initiated, and some, and you know, and these efforts typically have varying levels of people in there in terms of talent, and then they have varying levels of you know financings that are available around them, and then if you advance in time, what typically happens is. You know, there's, there's typically one or two or three winners that emerge and everybody else kind of falls to the sidelines or falls to the wayside, right? And so, and it's not, gen, and it's, it, it may not be accurate to say that, you know, more money necessarily is better, but generally if you're undercapitalized or underfinanced and don't have the right talent in your team, you know, you are working from a starting point of a disadvantage. So what I would say is, you know, I think in my kind of experience, actually looking at the enterprise side, I, th I think it's rare actually to see a world-class company emerge if they don't start foundationally with the right, you know, with the, with the adequately sized engineering team and adequately sized financing. Now, sometimes you will have a company that starts, you know, with a smaller round, right? And then later they pick it up, right? And then kind of bulk sure. up later. Sure. Right? And, yeah, and that yeah. does happen. And that's but, like but, a true seed, right? To right. That's right. But, but, in, but in many cases, right, if you or I are a world-class technology mm. uh, executive or individual out of a world-class company and we have a really strong idea, the reality is in many cases we just want to get going. We want to start recruiting. And if you truly are world-class, have a disruptive idea, we can go raise the money we need. The money so, is available. So now let's take that first example with the five million, let's say it's a straight series A. Right. And let, let's assume the entrepreneurs of the caliber where they can attract the, the, the yeah. type of team they need to, to do. Yeah. <clears throat> Typically in those rounds, are, are enterprise-focused, technology-focused uh, angels participating in these rounds? And you know, if so, who are they? And how, how can they help the founder in these cases in a way that, let's say, a classic firm yeah. may not be able to. This isn't the case where there's a $5 million round or where there's a... Yeah, let's yeah, say it's yeah. a 5 to $8 yeah, million yeah, exactly. dollar round, right? Yeah, so actually, so a couple of comments. One is I would say it is common, like let's say in the 5 to $8 million Series A, yeah. where there's a one or two venture firms involved. Yeah. It is quite common in those cases to see a little bit of money, you know, kept aside. Actually, what I often will do in the rounds, you know, we're involved with, if, it, if it's possible, will typically reserve just a very small amount of money for value-added individuals to come mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, who those individuals are may vary company by company. It also depends on the composition of the team. You know, it could be a, it could be a CEO, a CTO, a VP of marketing, a VP of sales in a related market, 
where the individual is not conflicted, has some time to help, hmm. right? So that's quite off. That's quite. So you're saying that's quite typical. You're saying as an investor, putting those rounds together based yeah. on like what space the company is in or what challenge yes. they may face in the future. Exactly. That there's always an executive or product person out there exactly. on the enterprise side. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, I think going back to the previous piece of the seed side as well, right? I mean, we, it's worth mentioning, you know, Greylock mm. is very active on the seed side, right? And we do, we're selective, but we're also active, right? And just, and, and sometimes, you know, we do see great companies, you know, take seeds first and then later kind of grow into, you know, tremendous enterprises. You know, one example I've personally been involved with there is a company called Instart Logic, where, you know, three engineers showed up in our office maybe, what, two years ago now, and you know we vowed, you know they vowed us enough, kind of literally on the spot. You know we committed a half a million dollars to them in that particular case. Left their seed, led their seed. This company is called Instart Logic, uh, Manav, Hari, and Ragu. And at the time they just wanted to raise a million dollars. They weren't exactly sure about the applicability of that technology. And then they kind of continued on to build, you know, a service, you know, which basically helps accelerate websites. And you know the company is you know up and going, you know, in a significant way and growing customers today. Great, great. So. And that, you know, that's a great example of you know, world-class engineers that kind of started out with the technology you know, idea, weren't exactly sure of the exact market they're going to address. So in that particular case, I think they were correct to take a seed just to kind of explore and develop that further. And then the moment they knew what they were doing with that, then they went out you know, for a larger round.